Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the book of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is where we're going to be tonight. I'm going to invite you to turn to uh, chapter 19. Luke 19 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1043 and you will find our text for the evening. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. So uh, what is it that makes you tick? Not, not what is it that ticks you off, because I don't really have time to deal with that. But what is it that makes you tick? What is it that, that is, you know, kind of that motivating factor in your life? If you peel away the layers of busyness, of work, of activity, what is it that drives you as a person? What gets you energized? What gets you excited about life? Uh, see, who are you down deep? Uh, one of the reasons I love uh, getting to know people, one of the reasons that I kind of make that standing offer about, you know, hey, if I don't know you, if you don't know me, if, if you've been sitting there, you know, let me take you to lunch sometime because I want to hear your story. I want to get to know you. I, I want to discover how God has redeemed your life. And I love learning what motivates people. Uh, I love learning what drives people, who they really are down deep. And, and because that's where, you know, the community really becomes real. And, and so over the next few weeks, I want you to find out what makes Calvary tick. Uh, I want to share with you, uh, you know, our heart and, and what motivates us. I want to peel back the layers and, and kind of reveal who we are down deep. Uh, now, some of you have been coming to Calvary for a long time, and you go, all right, I already know that, so this is going to be kind of a reminder for you uh, a little bit. But if you're newer to Calvary, this may help you understand why we do what we do. Now, a lot of you know what we do. You see the things that we do. You see the activity. You see the, the services, all that kind of stuff. But this is the why. This is the, the what motivates us behind the activity and, and all that's going on. So, uh, so I hope that helps you know and understand who we are. And if you're checking us out, if you want to know more about who Calvary is and what we're all about, then this will really help you to figure out whether you want to plug in and be a part of us and commit uh, wholeheartedly because we want you to. But we're going to tell you who we are uh, and let you figure that out. See, it all begins with our mission. See, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And uh, that may be something that you've noticed when you walked in the lobby, that part of that mission statement is there in the main lobby. How many of you ha have noticed that? Okay, a lot of hands went up. Some of you are like, there's words in the lobby? <laughs> it's okay. I could, I could walk in here a bunch of times and not see that. That's that, That's entirely possible for me so there's no judgment here but uh, you've heard us repeat this over and over if you've been here uh, it's because we take it seriously our mission is something that is incredibly significant to us and, and in everything that we do everything that every decision that we make is influenced by that decision of us wanting to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus and so uh, we're going to keep talking about that and keep promoting that. But I want you to understand the mission is connected to everything we're about to talk about. But our first core value, the, the, the first one that we list, we got four core values that we're going to talk about through the next few weeks. But our first core value is calling. It relates directly to the mission because we are called to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. We're called to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Now, when we use the word called, we, we don't mean it's a suggestion. It's a calling. It's not an option. It's a mandate. And it's a mandate from Jesus. And that's where we get to our text tonight. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Uh, to some of you, this is a very familiar story. It's one of my favorite stories in the gospel. I think it's one of the most radical stories of life change in the gospels. So read along with me, if you will. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, 
for Jesus was about to pass that way. And let me just pause right there and just ask, how many of you are hearing the Zacchaeus song in your head right now? All right. How many of you have no idea what the Zacchaeus song is? Okay. Ask one of the people who raised their hands earlier. They'll sing it for you after the service, okay? If you grew up going to church like I did, then that's what they taught you, that Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. And there's a song you can sing. I am not going to sing it for you, okay? So, and when Jesus came to that place, verse 5, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So, this is an amazing story of life change. Uh, it's amazing on so many different levels. Uh, just real quickly, uh, tax collectors were the, the uh, most, loathed, most loathed person in society at the time of Jesus. I mean, they were traitors to their nation. They worked for the Romans against the Jews. They could profit off of the people. They could take whatever they wanted uh, because they had legal authority basically to rip people off. And, and so people detested and despised tax collectors. So it was scandalous that Jesus went to the home of a tax collector, surrounded by his tax collector friends. They, in the story, are religious leaders who don't like what Jesus did, and they're grumbling and complaining because holy people don't hang out with tax collectors and sinners like that. And in the middle of that, you see a, an incredible repentance of Zacchaeus when he says, Lord, uh, I'm giving half my goods to the poor. Okay, if you're a tax collector, you're rich because you're greedy. Uh, greedy people don't give away half their possessions to the poor. Something changed in Zacchaeus. Something incredible changed in Zacchaeus. And suddenly he goes, hey, you know what? Instead of trying to take from people as much as I can, I want to give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've wronged anyone, I'll pay back four times as much as I took. That's an incredible life change that happens in the silence of what's going on while Jesus is hanging out at Zacchaeus' house. And then Jesus says, this guy is a child of Abraham like everyone else that's part of this nation. Except Jesus is talking about being a child of Abraham by faith. This is an amazing story of life change that summarizes our purpose. Our purpose, what we're all about as a church, what we're all about as a ministry. And, and it's summed up in Jesus' mission statement in verse 10, for he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Our purpose is to join with Jesus in seeking and saving that which is lost. That was Jesus' purpose. And so if we're a follower of Jesus, it's our purpose. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, then guess what? This is your purpose. This is your God-given purpose. This is our calling because Jesus wants us to join him in seeking and saving that which is lost. It's the family business. And he says, hey, I want you to be a part of this. And so you and I, as followers of Jesus, have an opportunity to join with Jesus on his mission. On the thing that he said, this is why I'm here, to seek and to save the lost. And now we get invited to this journey and we have an opportunity to hang with Jesus while he's changing the lives of men and women around the world. Now, since a lot of you raised your hand, you knew the Zacchaeus story, you sang the Zacchaeus song uh, when you were kids, you can still sing it, uh, then you also got a dose of a lot of guilt and manipulation and obligation that went with this whole purpose. Because it went something like this. 
in a lot of churches. You're a follower of Jesus, so you have to tell people about Jesus. You have to. This is your obligation. And as a good child of church, I took that obligation on, and I did all kinds of stuff that I didn't really want to do. A lot of you have done stuff you didn't really want to do, knocked on doors, you know, talked to strangers, tried to pass out tracts, do things like that. And, and I did it because I had to. I was supposed to. It was an obligation. And that motivation is really terrible because there wasn't any joy there wasn't a lot of success and here's the thing this isn't an obligation this is an opportunity the son of God the savior of the world the one who gave himself for you who changed your life is saying to you, hey, I want you to be a part of this eternal mission of life change where we get to go and we get to share the hope that we have received. That we get to tell people that we're forgiven and that God will forgive them too. That we get to talk about how the fact is that we were destined for hell and because of Jesus, we're going to heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like an obligation. That sounds like an opportunity. It sounds like something I get to do, not something I have to do. And I get to share all of that because Jesus Christ changes lives. Jesus changes lives. Let's be real clear about this. I can't change your life. I don't have the power to do that. And by the way, you can't change anybody else's life. <laughs> How many of you have tried and failed miserably? Yeah. Some of you are sitting next to your projects. Didn't work. <laughs> Didn't work at all, did it? See, you can't change lives. Churches can't change lives. Churches can't save anybody. Programs can't save anybody. People can't save anybody. Jesus is the only one who can change our lives. Jesus is the only one who can forgive sin. Jesus is the only one who can deliver heaven. Think about that. All kinds of songs out in the secular world about heaven. You know, people want to get there. People want to get to paradise. People, you know, want to climb the stairway. Whatever it is, they, they think, oh, okay, there's, i got to get to heaven. And Jesus is the only one who can deliver. He's the only one that makes an opportunity. He's the only one who gives people a chance. He's the only one who can change lives. So who here can attest that Jesus Christ changes lives? <laughs> Me? Yeah, okay. I'm glad you guys are excited about that. So who here can attest that Jesus Christ changes lives? Okay. See, I, I want, I'm, I'm kind of excited about the fact that he changed my life. See, here's the thing. If Jesus Christ has changed your life, then you know this. If you've experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus, you know this. You're like, Jesus, I know him. Right? I, I mean, it's, it's personal. It's not abstract. It's not obtuse. It's not like some religious thing. This is a personal thing. It's real to you. Now, if you haven't experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus, if you're sitting there and you're kind of like raising your hand, you know, hesitantly, and you're clapping, but you're like, I don't get it. Or maybe you're just visiting with someone and you think, these people are nuts. <laughs> we're okay with that. Okay? Perfectly fine. Go ahead and judge. We're, we're, we're not going to judge you, but you can, get, you can judge us. We get it. No, but if you're looking at, at this, you, you don't understand, then we want you to come to that place where you experience what we've experienced because Jesus has changed us. We're not the same because of him. And we want you to surrender to Jesus Christ. We want you to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead because that's how he's going to set you free. And, and we've already told you that our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. You're here because you're either interested in following Jesus or somebody who loves you invited you. So we would love for you to embrace Jesus because he's the one who changes lives. That's why our goal is simply to introduce people to Jesus. Our goal is to introduce people to Jesus. Uh, Zacchaeus met Jesus and he was changed. I mean, completely, radically changed. This guy named Andrew, who was one of the 12 apostles, took his brother, you may have heard of him, Peter, the apostle Peter. He took Peter to Jesus, and, and, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. He didn't try to convince his brother that Jesus was Messiah. He just took him 
to meet Jesus. The Apostle Paul, he, he hated Jesus. He was persecuting the church. He was actually on the road to a city to arrest people and put him in jail because they were believers in Jesus. And Jesus met him on the road, revealed himself supernaturally to him on the road. And Paul's life was never the same afterward. Okay? So our goal, our hope is to introduce people to Jesus. We don't have to push people. We don't have to argue with people. Some of you need to figure that out on social media. Okay? You're not going to argue anyone into the kingdom. It's just not going to work. You're not going to persuade somebody who doesn't want to be persuaded, and we definitely don't want to try to manipulate people into the kingdom. I've seen it. It's ugly. We just need to introduce people to the one, the only one who can really alter their lives and change their eternal destiny. And so everything we do at Calvary is to try and make it easier for you to introduce your friends to Jesus. Think about that for a minute. Everything we're doing is trying to make it easier for you to introduce your friends to the Savior. So the way we worship, the, the, the children's ministry, the student ministry, uh, Celebrate Recovery, Life Groups, Calvary Christian Academy, Mom's Life, uh, Serving on Main Street, Serve Our Schools, the Food Drive, all of that is to try to make it easy for you to introduce people to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the one who can change their lives. Now that's our purpose. It really is that simple. Our, our calling is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. It's not an option. So that's our purpose. Let's talk about our practice. How do we do this? Um, in other words, what are we doing that we want you to join us in doing? What's our strategy for accomplishing this calling, this purpose that we're involved in, uh, of trying to seek and to save the lost? So let's talk about the how and, and get real practical here for a little bit. Our strategy for accomplishing this, this purpose is simple and it's straightforward, and so far it's been pretty effective. Okay, a lot of you already said Jesus has changed your life, that's cool. Uh, what I love is the fact that over the last five years, We've had 663 people declare their faith in Jesus Christ in baptism. Isn't that cool? See, if, by the way, if I'm going to brag on anything, that's what I'm going to brag about right there. 663 people saying, Jesus has changed my life. I'm a new person. I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm going to believe in him. So uh, we're, we're going to kind of keep up with this strategy for right now. So here's our strategy. It's really simple. I uh, hope it makes sense to you. First of all, we're going to serve people. We're going to serve people uh, because we want to meet people's needs. Zacchaeus needed friendship. Okay, he was rich, he was healthy, didn't need healing, didn't need money, didn't need food, uh, and he needed friendship. And so, what did Jesus do? And by the way, I want to be like Jesus, like this uh, a lot. Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. <laughs> I think I have that same spiritual gift, so uh, you know, I like that. Uh, but uh, but anyway, he, he just said, "Hey, I'll come hang out with you." And in the, in the Gospels, in the story, it doesn't say that Jesus preached a sermon while he was there. It doesn't say that Jesus had a healing, you know, crusade while he was there. He just hung out with Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus' friends. And that impacted Zacchaeus, and his life was changed. So at Calvary, we serve people. We want to meet their needs. And we serve people not so that we can preach at them. Not so we can put a tract in their hand and say, here, read this. Just to let them know that God actually cares about them and that we care about them in the community. Um, when I was in college, uh, I went to a Christian college and I was one of the preacher boys because I knew I was going into ministry. And, and, uh, and so somebody came up to me one day and said, hey, you're one of the preacher boys? I said, yeah. And they said, do you want to preach at the Phoenix Rescue Mission? I go, what's the Phoenix Rescue Mission? They said, well, it's, you know, we get a bunch of the drunks together and, uh, you, you know, we make them sit in a room, you preach at them, and then we feed them. I said, can you feed them first and then let me preach? They said, well, no, then they'll leave. And I said, can you feed them first and then invite them to stay for the sermon? They said, no, that's not how it works. They got to listen to the sermon so they get the food. And I said, I'm not going to do it. it. It just... Even as a even as a twenty year old, it felt like manipulation. It felt like we were trying to control people, trying to say, "Hey, you have to you have to pay the price for we'll feed you. 
got to listen to the Jesus stuff before we'll feed you. And, and I'm like going, I don't think that's how Jesus did it. Uh, you see, here's what happens when we serve people. When we serve people, we go out in the community and we do these projects, and some of you are like, do we all have to do another project? I'm tired. When we go out and do these projects in the community, when we serve the community, you know what happens? We earn the right to be heard. We gain credibility by cleaning schools and feeding teachers and painting playgrounds and putting on car shows and handing out candy and playing games with kids. We earn the right to be heard. And see, in the past, the problem has been this. The church, because we have the truth of God, we just wanted to tell people what they needed to know. And so we just told people what they needed to know. We didn't show a lot of love. We didn't show a lot of compassion. We just told people the truth. Here's what you need to do. You need to change your life. There, I did my part. And, and all that is, is lecturing people. That's a monologue. So how many of you like to be lectured? There's a couple of you that raised your hands. I don't believe you. Okay. None of us like to be lectured at. We don't like to be dressed down. We don't like to be talked to like we're some, you know, four-year-old. By the way, four-year-olds don't like that either. Most of us, when we get lectured, we just kind of tune the person out and discount them, discredit them, stop listening. And by the way, that was, that's what happened with the church, is we're just telling people the truth. As we're just lecturing at them, they stopped listening to us. The truth didn't change. The reality that Jesus is the only Savior didn't change, but people stopped listening. And so at Calvary, we just assume that we need to actually build relationships through serving people so that people might want to listen to the truth. You see, we don't want to just have a monologue. We want to have a dialogue with people. We don't want to lecture anybody. We want to have a conversation with people. Does that make sense? We want to listen to people and, and, and talk back and forth. You know, that's what relationships are about. By the way, that might work better with your kids, too. Try more of the dialogue and less of the monologue in your relationships and see what God does with that. So we serve people, and then we relate to people. We relate to people. Uh, relationships. Jesus was all about relationships. You see it with Zacchaeus. He wasn't just uh, somebody he had to go to lunch with. He, he wanted to get to know Zacchaeus, and because of that, Zacchaeus' life was changed. We're talking about real, authentic, life-changing relationships. And by the way, Jesus was criticized for going with Zacchaeus. The, the religious leaders didn't like that. Verse 7, again, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. They didn't like that. Religious people don't like that. Religious people didn't like what Jesus did anyway. Um, but see, here's the truth. Truth is, Jesus loves people. And the truth is, people are sinners. Have you guys noticed that? Have you noticed that when you look in the mirror? People are sinners. Have you noticed that when you're looking across the table at your family? People are sinners. You know when I notice it? It's when I'm driving. <laughs> Just being honest here. You know, we, trust me, we drive selfishly. Right? And we're sinners. You see it in restaurants. You see it in lines. You see it all over the place. And, and, and so here's the thing. Jesus loves people. People are sinners. And Jesus hangs out with sinners. Aren't you glad he does? Yeah, I am too. Now, religious people tend to think about people as good and bad. And they tend to label people as good and bad people. And, and their idea is you love the good and you condemn the bad. Uh, but that's all wrong. See, if you're looking at people as good and bad, you're missing the point. Because Scripture says we're all bad. We're all sinners. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. There is none who is righteous, not even one. None of us. 
Look, we're all guilty. We all deserve hell. So what, you want to be the best person in hell? <laughs> Go ahead. Look, I'm a sinner, and I know it. I'm not good, but Jesus loves me. And I need his grace, and you need his grace, and every person in this world needs the grace of God that's provided in Jesus Christ. That's why we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus because if you've experienced grace, you know how good it is and you're like, wow, I, I've experienced this. I want to share this with people who don't have it. It's not good and bad. It's just simply those who've already found the grace of God and everybody else who needs to find the grace of God. That's it. Because grace is the only hope we have. For anyone, for this lost, broken, messed up world, grace is the only hope that we have. And so Jesus calls you and me to be real, to be authentic, to be not fake. Jesus calls us to honesty, to live as real people of faith with real struggles who are rejoicing in God's forgiveness and in God's redemption. So we don't pretend here at Calvary. We don't pretend to have it all together. We don't pretend that we're good. We, we just confess our struggles. We confess our failures. We confess our mistakes. And we celebrate grace and God's power to redeem our lives. It's not pretty, but it is powerful. It's not easy, but it's incredibly worth it. But that means that you have to be willing to be honest about who you are, about what you've done, about how you failed, about how God's mercy is important to you because you know how much he is forgiving you from. And the reality is that every single one of those acts of rebellion, Jesus paid for on the cross. Specifically, he paid for it on the cross. That's an amazing reality. So are you being real in your relationships? I, I really hope and pray that you are not trying to pretend here. Because um, if you're trying to look better than you really are, if you're trying to act like you got it all together and you don't have struggles and you haven't failed in the past, all that kind of stuff, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grieve that because you're spending energy hiding rather than embracing the power of God that comes with confession. See, that's the biblical word for honesty. Confession. This is who I am, and I need a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And when we can live in that, when we can travel in that, when we can encounter other people with that attitude, it changes the way we see them, and it changes the way we relate to them, and it makes Jesus incredibly more attractive. So we serve, we relate to people, and then we invite people. Jesus invited Zacchaeus into a relationship. I know Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, but he was basically saying to Zacchaeus, hey, let's go ahead and have a relationship. And by the way, Jesus did that with a lot of people, and some said yes, and some said no. In fact, in the previous chapter, chapter 18, there's a story of a guy who came to Jesus seeking eternal life and went away sad because when Jesus invited him into a relationship, he said no. He said no. And Jesus is inviting us into that relationship. He's inviting us in that life-changing relationship with himself. And at Calvary, we're an invitation church. Now, don't take that the wrong way, because we don't do altar calls uh, very often where we say, hey, come down here to the front and, and make a decision for Christ right now. I grew up in those kind of churches, uh, and, and I can just be honest with you, uh, uh, I don't like the altar call kind of thing because it puts a lot of importance on emotion. It puts a lot of importance on right now. It kind of felt pressured, especially when the kind of churches I grew up in because we'd have revivals. Anybody ever remember revivals? Hated revivals. Yes, I know. I'm a spiritual man and I love God. I can, you can love Jesus and hate revivals. I hated revivals because this was back in the days before DVRs and uh, Netflix. And if you missed a show in prime time, you couldn't see it for six months. <laughs> Talking about, as a kid, priorities right here. 
I didn't like revivals for that reason. I didn't like revivals because the preachers didn't know when to end and they would give an invitation that would last forever because they wanted people to make decisions because they wanted to tell the next church how many people made decisions at the last church. And so they, we would just keep singing just as I am forever and ever and ever. Right? Some of you have been there. Some of you are like me. You're on the back row with your friend. You're going, you repent. No, you repent. I repented last revival. Okay, rock, paper, scissors, loser has to go up and repent. <laughs> See, it, you know, we didn't actually do that, but now I think that would be really cool. But, uh, <laughs> but it felt like, and I've been there when there was so much pressure, come on, you got to do it, and I got to drag you down here, and, and I'm kind of going, hey, wait, wait, time out. Don't we believe in the Holy Spirit of God? Isn't it the Holy Spirit's job to draw us? to Jesus, to convince us that he's real. It's not my job, it's not your job. It's, it, we just, our job is to invite people. Not use pushy, high-pressure tactics, just invite people. By the way, I don't know about you, but I hate high-pressure tactics. If someone tries to sell me something high-pressure, I walk away. I don't think Jesus is any different. So, so our goal is just to build relationships with real people. You guys have relationships with real people. That should be pretty easy. And then we want to speak the truth in love to our friends and to our family because we know the life-changing power of Jesus. And so we want to, you know, let them know about that. And then we want to invite people. Invite people to come to church with you. Invite people to, to follow Jesus. And when they're ready, we want to celebrate their decision to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. And by the way, we celebrate their decision when? When they get baptized. When they enter into the waters and they say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus and I want the whole world to know that I'm an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you're here and you've, you know that Jesus is your Savior and you haven't been baptized, we want to help you be obedient to Jesus. Just let us know and we'll baptize you when or where. I had a guy ask me the other day, would you baptize me in the lake? Yep, I will. He goes, in November? And I go, yep, I will. If you're dumb enough to get in the water in November, so am I. I'm only going halfway under. You're going all the way under. I'll cheat. I'll bring waiters. I don't care. Uh, look, I, I, our, our goal is to help you be obedient to Jesus. So if you're here and you're like, yeah, I've made that decision, uh, but you haven't declared it publicly, then what are you waiting for? We want to help you do that because we want to celebrate your decision to follow Jesus Christ. And so we want Calvary to be a place that you want to attend and that you want to bring your friends so that they can meet Jesus because you know Jesus can change their lives. We're not asking you to do a whole bunch of religious stuff. We're not asking you to go out and knock on doors and pass out tracts. Uh, and, and, you know, we just want you to be a real friend and invite your friends to meet the one who can change your life forever. So, it boils down to this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ changes lives? Okay, if you do, if you really do, then who are you going to invite to meet Jesus? Who do you want, who do you plan to introduce to Jesus Christ? The one who will change their destiny. Let's pray together.